Oh, good. I had my head down. There it is. All right, thank you, Titus and Cheyenne. Could you turn your Bibles? Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And we're going to uh, wrap up our study of 1 John 4, 10 this evening, noting that uh, love is defined by God sending his son to be the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, and not just for our sins, uh, but the non-believer as well. But John's just talking in the context of the believer's sins in 1 John 4.10. And uh, before we get underway, just uh, if you could keep in your, uh, your prayers, uh, I have um, a couple of friends of mine need uh, have um, people that they um, want you to put on their prayer list. I've already put out, those are on my email list, I've already uh, put out a... A, um, an email for these people's families, members of their family. Uh, Pastor Jim Ricard, uh, he is, uh, his father had a fall and broke a vertebrae in his back. And he's like, I think he's 80. He's older than my father. And uh, so he broke a vertebrae and he's in some pain. So he's going to see a specialist determine what, to determine what to do about it. So if you could keep him in your prayers. And also, I have another friend of mine going way back, uh, uh, his name's Dave Tagger. He used to cut my hair. Of course, he did a good job. I, don't have, I have no hair left. But um, he lives in Massachusetts. And he has a five-year-old niece named Hannah who has a cancerous tumor. So if you could keep her and her doctors and her parents, John and Jackie, in your prayers, that would be very, uh, very much appreciated. And I'll keep you updated uh, as to uh, how, they're, how they're progressing uh, with their health as, uh, as I get information. So... If you could, that would be very much appreciated if you keep those people in your prayers. So, without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we're in fellowship with God. Uh, confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God according to 1 John uh, 1 9. We maintain that fellowship, of course, by our obedience to the Word of God. When we do that, we're obeying the Spirit who's inspired the Scriptures and speaks to us through the Scriptures when we're in fellowship with Him. So, uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing, or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5 7 says Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for our relationship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is eternal. And we thank you for the fellowship uh, with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the uh, offshoot of that, the result of that. We thank you, Father, for our union identification with your Son, Jesus Christ. And through that identification with your Son, his death and resurrection, giving us the victory positionally. Uh, over sin and Satan, and also um, the guarantee of this victory when a resurrection body permanently, and also um, the potential to experience that victory now and in time if we obey what your, your, the Spirit is saying to us in the Scriptures and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to you, dead to the cosmic system of Satan and alive to you, Father. We also, uh, we just thank you, Father, for um, your faithfulness to us, to us as individuals and as a church. We thank you for your faithfulness to us uh, here in Marion for the last, uh, coming up on eight years, believe it or not, in, uh, in August, this coming August. So I thank you, Father, for uh, delivering us and uh, protecting us and, for, uh, and delivering us from all our trials and tribulations as a ministry, as individuals, and as a, as a church over the last uh, seven and a half, eight years. And we just thank you, Father, again for your faithfulness and your uh, uh, always being there for us. We also thank you for the Thompsons, raising them up and their, their family and the sacrifices that they make so that we could teach in their home four days a week and broadcast classes to, throughout the world in their home. We thank you for each uh, for them and we thank you for Titus's work and Cheyenne's work with the sound of recordings this evening. We thank you for their service, the technology, and people taking advantage of the technology. We pray there be no problems in this area this evening. And also... I pray, Father, that you would uh, help everyone who is in the audience, those in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing or listening to this class live through the website or a later date through the recordings on the website or YouTube or Sound Faith, wherever they're posted. 
We pray that you would help each person in the body of Christ to understand what's being taught. Help them to concentrate. Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening and guide them in the application. Pray that you would work mightily and powerfully through them and also through myself. Empower me to be used as your instrument by the Spirit to communicate accurately your word to your people so that they can receive the necessary spiritual nourishment. I thank you for giving me the great honor and privilege to proclaim your word to your people. And also I thank you so much for the people that you've uh, given me uh, to be under my care. Uh, on your behalf, and uh, I pray, Father, you help me to continue to uh, minister to your people through the communication of your word, whether it's behind this pulpit or in the pulpit uh, or outside of the pulpit. I pray, Father, also for my good friend Jim Ricard's uh, father, Dave. I pray that you would help him and give the doctors and nurses wisdom treating him and heal him uh, from this broken vertebrae. I also lift up another friend of mine, Dave Tagger, his his, uh, niece, uh, Hannah, who has a cancerous tumor, five-year-old niece, and I pray you would give uh, the doctors and nurses wisdom treating her and also comfort to her and her family, uh, John and her parents, John and Jackie, as well, Father. And so, Father, we just uh, lift up these prayers and requests and thanksgiving. We pray they be according to your will, purpose, and plan, and the answer based solely upon the merits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to continue our study of the uh, ninth major section of 1 John, which is contained in verse, 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3. And uh, again, this is t- talking a, a lot about the love of God, this uh, particular section. And we're going to be continuing this study by noting or finishing off 1 John 4, 10. And uh, we saw last, uh, it was last Thursday, uh, we, uh, we, we noted uh, that love is defined by God's love for the believer not the other way around. By no means uh, is love defined by our love for God, but it's rather it's defined, the essential nature of it is, based, is, is, is what God did for us in sending his son to the cross for us. In fact, tonight we'll be wrapping up our study of, uh, well, actually we'll have one more evening of 1 John 4.10 t- uh, tomorrow, but uh, tonight we'll continue our study of 1 John 4.10 by noting that love is defined by God sending his son to be the, to be the propitiatory sacrifice for the believer's sins. So last, uh, last uh, Thursday we saw that John was trying to say what love is defined by and what it is absolutely not defined by. And then he comes out tonight, we'll see, in the exegetical clause contained in this verse by asserting that it's, uh, the love is defined by what God the Father did for us in sending his son into the world to be a human being in order to suffer substitutionary spiritual and physical death on the cross which propitiated the Father's holiness which demanded that sin and sinners be judged. So he didn't want to judge us and, uh, and he therefore sent his son in our place to receive that judgment on the cross uh, through those uh, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross and so that is the reason why we could have an, uh, the offer of an eternal relationship and a fellowship and forgiveness of sins uh, was made possible because of the fact that the Son propitiated the Father. And in fact, this allowed God to uh, express, uh, he expressed his love doing that. And also as a result of Christ doing that for us, uh, he was able to uh, express his love and give us grace and mercy and love and forgiveness uh, as a result of that great sacrifice, he, uh, he uh, bestowed this great love and mercy upon us and forgiveness of sins through our, uh, as a result of our faith alone in Christ alone. So we're going to wrap up, uh, continue our study, excuse me, of 1 John 4.10 here this evening. We have one more class uh, tomorrow in 1 John 4.10 because this verse is presenting another reason. It's presenting another reason, as we'll see tomorrow, for the believer to obey the commandment to love one another. And it's also giving another purpose for the, for the incarnation and hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. So um, the reason why I'm going to do that tomorrow is because we, gotta, we can't lose sight of the fact of wh- why John is saying what he's saying in 1 John 4.10. It's directly related to the command he issues in 1 John 4.7 to love one another. So uh, this is uh, what we'll be noting here tomorrow evening. So if you could, we're going to be, as we've been doing, as, as our custom, we like to study the passage we're looking, working on for a particular evening in its context. So the immediate context here is 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3. So let's read those verses. I'm going to read them uh, from the Net Bible. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. As we'll see that atoning a sacrifice, uh, I'll, I'll translate it propitiatory sacrifice. Uh, either one works. And uh, I'm just using the one I'm using because I prefer it uh, over the atoning sacrifice. So it says in verse 11, Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we reside in God and he in us, and that he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God resides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has in us. God is love, and the one who resides in love resides in God, and God resides in him. By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because just as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. We love because he loved us first. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he is a liar. Because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And the command we have from him is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, no chapter break in the original, has been fathered by God. And everyone who loves the father loves the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of God. Whenever we love God, and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And then right there, that actually concludes the ninth major section of 1 John. Then the next statement begins the, four, the tenth major section. And his commandments do not weigh us down, because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. And when he speaks of the world there, he's speaking of the cosmic system of Satan, which we studied uh, in, in detail uh, uh, back when we studied 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So, as we see those verses, uh, 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 as we noted in our introduction to 1 John, those verses are speaking of the fact that, uh, is speaking of God's love and our love for each other, and it's paralleled uh, by 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 17, which speaks of the familiar commandment to love one another. So those two sections, 1 John 1, 5 to 1 John 2, 2, which constitutes the third major section of the epistle, parallels the ninth major section of the epistle contained in 1 John 4, 7 through 1 John 5, 3. And that's because this epistle is set up in a chiastic structure, inverted parallelism. Certain sections, pericopes, uh, are paralleled by another per uh, pericope later on in the epistle. And the one that had, doesn't have any parallel uh, that section is the main section or the heart of the epistle, and that would be 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. And unsurprisingly, uh, that's all about the command to love one another as well. So this is, uh, this is telling us, uh, uh, th this particular epistle is, is telling us that this command to love one another, obedience to it, is absolutely essential if we're going to have fellowship with God. And if we're not doing this command, then one, we're not loving God, and then we're not having fellowship with God. And of course, if we don't, uh, the absence of uh, failing to obey this command constitutes hating our fellow believer. Uh, that's how God looks at it under the inspiration of John. This is how John communicates it to us in this epistle in 1 John. Uh, so it, we're either, and of course, hate, according to John, is the absence of, the, of failing. To, it's actually the absence of love, or in other words, the failure to obey the command to love one another. So we demonstrate our love for God by our obedience to this command because he gave us this command and so when we do that uh, we'll, 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 uh, this will manifest the fact that we actually do love God and not to mention our fellow believers. So this is what Christianity is all about. Uh, it's obeying this command to love one another. And of course Jesus taught, and this is also has evangel evangelistic uh, overtones of course, if you compare this command where it was given, issued by Jesus in John 13, 34 and 35, we pointed this out many times. Uh, he says, by obeying the, this command that I give you to love one another as I have loved you, 
by this all people will know that you are my disciples. And that's alluding, all people speaking, of the non-Christian community. So uh, our, when we manifest God's attribute of love through obedience to this command, uh, we're going to, uh, it's an attraction to the non-believer. That doesn't mean everybody's going to believe in Jesus Christ because they see us loving each other. But it certainly will attract some people. And uh, so this is uh, very important. We talk about, this is one of the things that are overlooked in Christianity, uh, and it's, it ought not to be the case. Uh, it, it's probably because of America, the way churches are in America. Uh, we want to evangelize so we can add numbers to our church, and because we think that, a lot of times we think that's going to mean that we're a success, uh, because we have the numbers. But actually, you know, doing programs and having a tent meeting and all that stuff, that's all well and good, but... Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe having, renting out a place and evangelizing the, the, the non-Christian in your community. And there's nothing wrong with that, but really the best way to evangelize them is how they see you and I operate in, with each other in our lives. Because that, and also, as we saw in the book of Ti Paul's epistle to Titus, are good works which are in obedience to the, to the various commands and prohibitions in the scriptures, and the, particularly the command to love, one, uh, love your neighbors yourself, uh, good works will, de will also attract the non-Christian to, uh, to Jesus Christ. So God, uh, Jesus Christ, who is the, our, the head of the body of Christ, we're members of the, individual members of the body of Christ, he's trying to, through us, uh, to reach the non-Christian community. So, we, in other words, uh, we're killing, killing a number of birds with one stone. When we obey this command, love one another, we're going to evangelize the non-Christian community, we're going to be demonstrating our love for God, and we're going to grow to maturity. And, uh, and experience fellowship with God. So this is uh, this is very critical. So the Christian way of life uh, could be character is could characterized by this command: love one another. And by the way, as I said this many times before, and uh, Christians need to hear, pastors need to teach this to their congregation, and p Christians need to understand this because if it's a supernatural thing to love one another as Christ loves, to manifest God's attribute of love through the obedience to this command is supernatural. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So, when we obey what the Holy Spirit is speaking to, to us in the Scriptures, to love one another, and all that involves, which would involve forgiving one another, and being patient and tolerant of one another, and praying for one another. Uh, when we do that, when we're obeying what the Spirit's telling us, He reproduces this love in our lives. So, when we obey what He says in the Scriptures, He's the one who's reproducing this love. So, that means that this love that John's talking about, we saw this last Thursday, love is not defined by human love, or our love for God. Uh, it's God. He manifesting his attribute of love and sending his son to the cross. And when we accept by faith Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become indwelt by the, each member of the Trinity. We, be, we also uh, are now the beneficiaries and the, uh, uh, and, uh, the uh, beneficiaries of this love in the sense that we receive the forgiveness of sins and, all, and everything else in our eternal relationship and fellowship with the Trinity. And so therefore that gives, the fact that we're beneficiaries, are beneficiaries of this love and are indwelt by the Trinity gives us the capacity to manifest this love. The non-Christian can't do this. So uh, you can always, and I pointed this out today as well, and I've seen this in ministry, when people are serving in a church and many people will quit a ministry because they cannot handle a situation with somebody in the, in the church. And whether it's the pastor, a deacon, or some other Christian in the ministry, and they will quit a ministry. I've seen it in other pastors could say amen to this throughout the centuries and up to the present moment. And it's all because they don't operate in this love. It's human love. that They're serving in their own flesh. Because if you were serving under the power of the Spirit, you would never quit a ministry without biblical justification. There are justifications to quit in a ministry. But... You, they, quit a ministry, they quit these ministries because they don't have, they're not operating in God's love. Because if they were operating in God's love, they would never quit the ministry. Why? Because God's love doesn't need an attractive object, attractive object to function. Uh, human love does. Uh, that's why marriages, Christian marriages, must be based upon this love. Because that's why people will stay together. If they're obeying what the Word of God says, the Spirit gives them the capacity to deal with marriage problems and to forgive one another and be patient and tolerant one another and stick together. So, uh, and so this is very important. We keep this in mind. So church, members of the church, individual members of the church, when somebody ticks you off, you won't leave because you're operating in this love because 
whether they are responding to you or being uh, reciprocating with you or appreciating what you do, you still do it regardless of what their response is to you. In fact, God sent his son to the cross regardless of the response of members of the human race. In particular, regardless of the response of the non-Christian. Uh, remember, we forget about this. God sent his son to the cross knowing full well in his omniscience that a lot of people, billions and trillions, and I don't know how many people, would reject his son as, as savior. Yet he still sent his son to the cross. That's clear in many passages. For, uh, 1 John 2.2, 2, we've seen that. Uh, 1 John 2.2, 2, he, he, he points that out. He's the, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, the Christian community, but the non-Christian community as well. So this love is, this is critical, that we alert, this is where, the, this is where the, as J. Vernon McGee used to say, where the rubber meets the road. This is where you get shoe leather to your Christian, Christianity. This is how we have a successful church. A successful church operates in this love. Not, you're not a successful church, and I'm not a successful pastor, and you're not a successful member of uh, your church because you have a lot of people going to your church. That's a lie. That's not true. You could be a you're, you could be success in God's eyes whether there's ten people in your church or a thousand people in your church or ten thousand. What matters is are you being faithful in particular? Are you operating in this command habitually? Is this what characterizes your life or not? If it doesn't, I don't care if you got ten thousand in your church. You're not a success. I don't care if you're a pastor or a lay person, if you're not practicing this love, you're not a success. So this is what we're looking at here in 1 John, and this is a, quite an epistle, and now you're seeing some of the reasons why I wanted to uh, do this epistle uh, in great detail when, I, uh, when we took it up. So uh, in the ESV, they translate 1 John 4.10, with this introduction out of the way. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us. And then it says, and sent his son to be the propiti propitiation for our sins. Now that phrase, uh, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, is an exegetical clause. Or we could say an explanatory clause. Because why? It's identifying specifically for us, the reader, what John means by the previous adversative clause. Which is what? Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. So the phrase, and sent his son to be the propitiate, propitiation for our sins, is identifying specifically how love should be defined as. It's emphatically not by our love for God, but that his love for us. In what sense that he loved us? Well, the phrase, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, is telling us specifically how he loved us. Now, the, the word sent there, apostello, and this word means to dispatch someone, to send someone with authority to a particular location, implying for a particular purpose. This would indicate that God the Father uh, dispatched, or we could say sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the human race with authority to be the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every one of the sins committed by the believer during the course of their lifetime. Now, when he says, uh, in context, when he says our sins, he's speaking of the Christian community in context. Though, this is true for, because he uses the uh, Christ's propitiatory sacrifice in 1 John 2, 2, in relation to the non-Christian community along with the Christian community. He, he was the propitiatory sacrifice in 1 John 2, 2 for not only the sins of the Christian community, but also for the non-Christian community. And that's called the unlimited atonement. Christ didn't simply die for the Christian. He died for the non-Christian as well. And people who don't think so, uh, they don't understand God's love. They don't understand the character of God's love or the nature of God's love. So when he says our sins, he's speaking of the Christian community, though... The Father, it is true, the Father sent the Son to be the propitiation for the sins of the non-Christian as well. We know that from 1 John 2, 2, as we'll point out in a little bit. When he says his Son, his Son there is actually describing the relationship between Jesus of Nazareth and, the, and God. And uh, it emphasizes that Jesus and the Father share the same divine nature. By calling Jesus his Son, he's saying... He shares the same attributes and character and nature as God. And so that's why the Jews picked up stones to kill Jesus because he basically was calling God his father. And they all knew the implications of that. You're, in other words, saying, you're God too. 
Because to say the, to ascribe uh, the title of, of, ascribe the word father to God as your father is to basically say, I have the same nature as God. So uh, that's why they picked up stones to kill him. Now, here's the key word, uh, propitiation. Uh, that word uh, in the Greek, for those who are interested, is the word hilasmos. And this word can be translated propitiatory sacrifice. We saw it in 1 John 2, 2 in our studies of 1 John. This refers, what does it mean, propitiatory sacrifice? Well, it means this. It means that Jesus Christ, substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, propitiated, or we could say satisfied, the Father's holy demands that sinners experience his wrath or righteous indignation for committing sin. Let me repeat that, and I'm going to explain each of the, ter- uh, the several of the terms in here for those who are not un- are not familiar with these terms that might be popping in for the first time and listening to our classes or have been with us not very long. So again, propitiation means that G- it speaks of a propitiatory sacrifice. And what does propitiation mean? It means that Christ on the cross with his death satisfied the Father's demands. His, he's holy. He demanded that sin and sinners be judged. So he didn't want to judge sinners. He wanted to have a relationship and a fellowship with us. So he sacrificed his son in our place. That's what substitutionary means. And when his death on the cross, it doesn't simply mean, when I speak of Jesus' death on the cross, I'm speaking of his spiritual death and his physical death. What do I mean by the spiritual death? I mean that when he was abandoned by his father on the cross, uh, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was basically experiencing separation from his father. And this is very important. Just because he was separated from his father on the cross, that's speaking of his fellowship, not his eternal relationship with the father. It's the same thing if we have no fellowship with the father because we sin, we're still a part of his family. He doesn't disown us. We're still a member of, of, the, of, the, of the family of God, yet we're not having fellowship with him. And very similarly, when Jesus suffered this abandonment from the Father, those last three hours on the cross, he was still a member of the Trinity. His eternal relationship with the Father and the Spirit was not separated. It was his fellowship with the Father. So for the, for the, for the Son... Uh, was uh, through his human nature for the first time was experiencing a loss of fellowship with his heavenly father. And that is what he was petrified and feared in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, he was, remember he says like drops of blood. Uh, it, it, the, the sweat was pouring out of him. He was on the ground several times in, in, in desperate prayer to the Father, not this, let this cup pass, nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. What was the cup? He would have to suffer the consequences for our sins and be abandoned by the Father on the cross. Still God, still a member of the Trinity, but his fellowship was severed with the Father those last three hours on the cross. And that was, the, that was what he feared. The suffering, physical torment, and the, that was one thing, but it was... What he feared most was this, the, the loss of fellowship with his heavenly father. So this was, this was a, at a great price. Think about this. The father and the son had no fellowship with each other on those last three hours on the cross in supernatural darkness for our sakes. For our sakes. So it came, it, our relationship and fellowship with God came at a great price to our God. Heavenly Father and to the Son and the Spirit. And Hebrews 9.14 says that Jesus was able to do this to his human nature by the eternal spirit. Hebrews 9.14 says that. So in the, in the, in this, on the, with the, uh, far as propitiation is concerned in our reconciliation and redemption, the Father is that member of the Trinity who acted as the judge and judging his son. And what was the judgment? He suffered the consequences for our sins. What was that? Separation from God. To understand this about Jesus and his, the relationship between his spiritual and physical death on the cross, you have to go back to Adam, the first man. Adam and Eve, when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, Jesus said, uh, the, 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 the incarnate Christ said to them in the Garden of, Gethsemane, uh, Garden of Eden, that in that day, that day you eat from it, you shall surely die. They didn't die, phys- they didn't die physically at that moment when they ate from it, but they lost fellowship with God. They hid themselves from God. 
and they were ashamed. They noticed that they were naked now. So that, that was their manifestation of a spiritual death on their part, which was, uh, so when they did that, then they died 900 years later, Genesis says, physically. So Jesus had to negate what Adam and Eve, Adam did, the first Adam did in the Garden of, Garden of Eden. He had to die spiritually, suffer that abandonment from the Father those last three hours on the cross, and then before he said, before he died of his own volition physically, he did die of his own volition physically, like no other man, he said, Tetelest die, it is finished. So he, he had to die spiritually to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, actually negate the problem of spiritual death in the human race and sins, personal sin, and his physical death negated uh, physical death in the human race as well as the sin nature which indwells our bodies. And people who says it's not in our bodies, it doesn't know what they're talking about. Because Genesis, back to the dust of the ground, God says. Yeah, basically, that's their physical bodies. So their physical, our physical bodies die because of the body of sin, Paul calls it. The sin nature is resident in the genetic structure of our physical body. In fact, if you get a blood work from your doctor, you get blood work, and from their, your blood, they're able to see a lot. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said in his resurrection body, and this is going to be true of our bodies, resurrection bodies, it's uh, uh, blood, uh, not, it's not blood and fl flesh and blood anymore. He calls it flesh and bone. In fact, I had a band. Uh, my last band Christian, was a Christian band uh, when I was in my late 20s and uh, early 30s, very early, 30, 31, called Flesh and Bone. And so we took it from that. So why is there no blood in the resurrection body? It's going to be flesh, bone, and spirit. And it'll be the resurrection body. So we, the, the, that, so Jesus had to die physically to negate the problem of physical death in the universe and, the cre and, and, and among the human, members of the human race, and also to negate the problem of the sin nature. That's why the, the resurrection body is needed for us, because uh, we, we, it has the sin nature in it. That's why we need a, one of the reasons why we need a resurrection body. So again, when we speak of propitiation, it refers to Jesus Christ's substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, satisfying the Father's holy demands that sinners experience his wrath, or in other words, his wrath speaks of his righteous indignation. So we, uh, we would, uh, his, his holiness demanded that sin and sinners be judged and experience his righteous indignation. So uh, this is very important. This means, propitiation means that God didn't sweep our sins under the rug. Uh, so he, he couldn't even offer us the forgiveness of sins in a eternal relationship and a fellowship with him unless he did this through his son. It was propitiated. He had to satisfy his demands of his holiness. So he didn't want to judge us again, so he judged his son in our place. That's why we say his substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths on the cross. This is very, very, very important. This is the heart of of Christianity, the nuts and bolts, because from what Christ did, which manifested the love of God, this is where we get our capacity to love. We're understanding this and accepting this by faith. So, then he says, for our sins. The word for sins there, harmatia, and this word is correctly translated. It refers to mental, verbal, and overt acts of sin from the perspective that, they, that these mental, verbal, and overt acts of sin miss the mark of the absolute perfection of God's holiness and are in disobedience to God's laws. The word our is the personal pronoun ego in the, in the first person plural form. It's correctly translated. It denotes possession and you could translate it each and every one of our. Uh, I, so that means uh, this referring to, uh, when he says our, he's referring to John and the recipients of 1 John and all God's children as a corporate unit. And it's used in a distributive sense, emphasizing that God did this to his son for everyone, each and every member of the Christian community. So, uh, therefore, uh, this, this is why you could translate each and every one of our sins. The distributed sense of this word saying, it's expressing God, the Holy Spirit, and, and the, through John, expressing that God did this for each and every one of us. In other words, put it this way, if you were the only sinner on the face of the earth, he would send his son to the cross for you. Now this word, ego, it's the object of the preposition peri, which is employed here as a marker of benefaction. What does that mean? It indicates that Jesus Christ's uh, propitiatory sacrifice was for the benefit, 
of each and every one of the sins committed by the believer during the course of their lifetime. I believe uh, the Net Bible, they translated uh, this particular phrase. Uh, let's see how they do it. Yeah, four our sins. That's the best way to translate this word uh, peri, F-O-R, because the word for in English, it's bringing out the idea that this preposition is a marker of benefaction, meaning you could even, you could even make it more wordier, for the benefit, or more explicit, for the benefit of each and every one of our sins. That's how you could translate it. In fact, I think that's exactly how I translate it. So if you could, uh, let's look at uh, my translation. 1 John 4, 7, and read all the way to uh, read 1 first, first John 4, 7, 8, 9, and also 10. And then we'll look at this doctrine of propitiation in this verse. In this verse. So look at 1 John 4, 7 in my translation, please. Beloved, let each one of us continue to divinely love one another because this love is a characteristic originating from God. And, that, and God in that context is the Father. Consequently, the one who at any time does divinely love has been fathered by God. And as a result, they know God experientially. They're having fellowship with him, with him. And also they're manifesting the fact that they're his children. Verse 8, the one who at any time does not practice divine love never enters into knowing God experientially. You're not having fellowship with Him. Why? Because God is divine love. By means of this, verse 9, God's love entered into the state of being revealed because of each and every one of us. Namely, that God the Father dispatched into the world with authority His one and only Son in order that each one of us would conduct our lives through Him, have fellowship with Him. Love is defined by means of this. By no means that we are loving God, but rather that he himself, in contrast to us, loved each and every one of us. Specifically, how did he do this? How did he love each and every one of us? He dispatched with authority his son to be the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every one of our sins. What a great statement by the Apostle John there, and those great, great assertions he's making there, uh, declarative statements in those verses. So therefore, we can see in, in 1 John 4.10, John's teaching that the substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, uh, which propitiated the demands of God's holiness, as we pointed out, is the ultimate expression of God's attribute of love. Why? Because they manifest, his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross in our place, manifest this attribute perfectly. It, in other words, it, it, it tells us the depth to which God loves us. And I've said this before, and I will keep repeating it. Because the Christian community needs to hear this. Because too many people in the Christian community are walking around with bad self-esteem, bad self-image, uh, depressed all the time, feeling sorry for themselves, and it shouldn't be the case. God loved you this much. Father and the Son and the Spirit, that they were willing to sacrifice, the Father and the Son and the, were willing to sacrifice their fellowship with each other for you and I. They care about us that much. So this is why the cross blows away all the arguments of the devil or non-Christians who, who question God and his, and his love. How could, God, does, you know, you know, how could God do this? How could God uh, you know, send his son? Uh, how, could, how could people, God send his creatures to the lake of fire? For, 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 what, what kind of, that's not a God of love. That's a God of holiness. But the God of love sent his son to the cross to be the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every one of the sins of the human race, not just the Christian community, so that we can have an eternal relationship and fellowship with them. So that's the other side of the equation, not the whole story. So people go to the lake of fire because they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't go because of their sins. How could they? If Jesus Christ is the propitiatory sacrifice, uh, and he's, in other words, he satisfied the sins, the demands of God's holiness, not only for our sins, but the sins of the non-Christian, okay? If he did that, how could any sin that we commit ever cause us to go to the lake of fire? People go to the lake of fire because of what? They reject Jesus Christ as Savior. And it says that in Revelation chapter 20, at the great white throne, they're judged according to their deeds. There's degrees of suffering in the lake of fire. Jesus made that clear. Woe to you, Bethsaida and Chorazin. If the miracles were performed in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. 
And because you've been given so much revelation, uh, and they didn't have it even close to what you had, people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgment upon you will be worse because you're rejecting me as Savior. And so they're judged according to their deeds, not according to their sins. And it's also their self-righteous deeds, their deeds that they thought could get them in heaven. I'm a good person. Look at all the good things I did. Those things are not going to get you into heaven because you couldn't do enough good deeds as a sinner to satisfy God who's perfect and holy. So that's why his son, who is perfect like he is, had to do the work of salvation on our behalf. So that's why human beings, it, it's a blow to the creature's pride when they, have to, when they have to say, I can't do anything. I have no merit with God. That's okay. Humility says, I, do, I know who has merit with God. That's Jesus Christ. So based upon the merit, the object of my faith, I know I'm going to re- I receive the forgiveness of my sins and I know I'm going to live with God forever and avoid his wrath because of who he is and what he did for me on the cross, that's why God saves me. That's why you can be totally confident, confident, boldly proclaim, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Because you are saved on the merits, not of yourself, but on the merits of another Jesus Christ. So therefore, John is teaching in 1 John 4.10 that the substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, which propitiated the demands of God's holiness, is the ultimate expression of of God's attribute of love because they manifest, these deaths manifest this attribute perfectly. And this is not the first time that the Apostle John asserts that Jesus Christ is the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every sin committed by each and every believer during the course of their lifetime since he makes this assertion in 1 John 2.2. 2. Hold your place, go to my translation of 1 John 1.5 and we'll read 1 John 1.5 to 1 John 2.2. 2. Please. 1 John 1, 5. 1 John 1, 5. First John 1, 5. Now this is the message which we have heard from him so that we are now imparting to each of you. Namely, that God is light. That is a figure for his holiness. Indeed, in him, and what is his holiness? The absolute perfection of his divine attributes. It's the, actually the sum total of his perfections. Perfections his attributes. So he says, indeed in him, there's absolutely no darkness, none whatsoever. If any of us, this is why you have to confess your sins as a believer, even because a fellowship, God's holy, he's not going to have fellowship with you if you're living in sin and unrepentant about it. If any of us enters into making the claim that we've been experiencing fellowship with him, yet we've been living in the darkness, then we're lying to ourselves. Consequently, we're unequivocally not practicing the truth. On the other hand, if any of us does at any time live in this light as he himself is that light, then we are experiencing fellowship with one another. Consequently, the blood of Jesus, the blood speaking of his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, it's a figure for them metaphor. His son does cause, the blood of his son, Jesus, his son, does cause each one of us to be purified from each and every sin. If any of us enters into making the claim that we have never experienced the guilt of sin, then we're deceiving ourselves. Consequently, the truth is unequivocally not existing in us. Then he says in verse 9, if any of us does at any time confess our sins, he, God the Father, is characterized as being faithful as well as just to forgive these sins for the benefit of each one of us. In other words, to purify each one of us from each and every unrighteous thought, word, or action. If any of us enters into making the claim that we have never sinned, then we are making him out to be a liar. Consequently, his word is unequivocally not existing in us. No chapter break in the original. 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I am presently writing these things, the things he just mentioned in those verses we just read, for the benefit of each of you in order that each of you would not enter into committing a sin. However, if anyone enters into committing a sin, we possess an advocate with the Father, namely Jesus, who is the Christ, who is a righteous person. An advocate with the Father means he's our defense attorney. So, as we saw this past Sunday, and many times in the past, in Revelation 12, Satan accuses us day and night at the throne room of God as we speak. 
It's manifested. He did this to the Old Testament saints, uh, like the high priest of Israel in Zechariah's day. That's recorded in Zechariah 3. So he does this. And he actually accused Job in the first two chapters of Job. Uh, you know, everything's good. If you, you put a hedge around Job, so if, if you take this hedge away and you let me get at him and, 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 and attack him physically and take away some of these blessings, uh, I bet you he curses you to your face. He's actually accusing there Job of being this way. And so uh, this is what he does. And this is what, listen to me, this is what, if you're a positive member of the body of Christ, you're, you're doing as word says and being faithful, I'll guarantee you, each one of you, I, I know this has happened with me, He's, doing, he's making accusations about you, and he's asking God to, to get at you. Uh, I, I bet you, God, if uh, you take this away from Bill uh, and, and put this on him, he will curse you to his faith and face, uh, your face, and he'll, he won't follow you anymore. Uh, that's what he does to each one of us. How much pressure can I put on you and see what you will cause you to get? He, basically, Satan thinks everybody's got a price. And basically, I think, if I do this to them, this will cause them not to follow. Uh, to follow after Jesus. Uh, whether it's giving them a lot of money, giving them a relationship. The wealth is what he uses. He pays people. He basically, it's usually basically, you know, okay, let's get these give these blessings to these people because I know that's going to dra drag them away. God permits it because God oversees everything. And what Satan means for bad, God means for good. So uh, God doesn't tempt us to sin. Satan is the one who does that. So he's, we need an advocate, and he's defending us at the throne room of God, Jesus is. Then we have in verse 2, with an explanatory clause, for you see, he himself, Jesus, the Christ, as the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. Propitiatory sacrifice, he lasts most, is the same word we see in 1 John 4.10. Then he says in verse 2, indeed, by no means, for our sins only, but also, in fact, for the entire world. There it is. The unlimited atonement. He didn't, our speaking of, notice he's making the distinguishing, uh, distinguishing the Christian community from the non-Christian community who's denoted by the phrase the entire world. Our sins, he's speaking of the Christian community. So that's unlimited atonement. He, Christ died for both the believer and the non-believer. And to say that he didn't do that is to attack what John's, the scriptures are saying and attacking the character and integrity of God, and misunderstanding the depth of God's love. This is how God loves us, all of us, both Christian and non-Christian. Those who trust in Jesus as Savior, and those who will not. The propitiatory sacrifice in both passages, 1 John 2.2 2 and 1 John 4.10, means again that Jesus Christ, voluntary, substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, satisfied, or we could say propitiated, the holy demands which God required that the, sins of, that the sins of every person in human history, past, present, and future, be judged. So when you think of propitiatory sacrifice or propitiation or atoning sacrifices, as the Net Bible has it, think of being satisfied. God says, I have certain demands. I have a certain standards. And my standards, because I'm holy, sinless, perfection, I, my standards say, I have to judge sin and sinners. But I love these sinners because I want to have a relationship and a fellowship with them. I got a problem here. So I'm going to send my son who's perfect like me in their place, suffer these deaths on the cross so that I can have a relationship and a fellowship with them. Therefore, that, his, those deaths on the cross will satisfy the, my holy demands, the demands of my holiness. Now, the spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross propitiated the Father in the sense that they paid the penalty for the sins of the entire world. Every human being stands condemned before a holy God because they are sinners by nature and practice. This is what we learned when we studied Romans, those who studied with me. Uh, Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.23. I was checking out and checked the hits on that, the, 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 video, and the, uh, the video and the audio and the, um, the, the written documents, the PDFs on those classes that we did at Prairie, Prairie View, over 500 hours in Romans. We get tons of hits on, on the written library and the video library. And also, it's interesting, also, with Daniel as well. So it, it's very, I'm, I'm very happy that, that's, that God is using that, and I'm very happy that people are benefiting from it, those studies, because that was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And, and those who were with me over Prairie View and, and came here know what I'm talking about. It was a lot of, through a lot of suffering get through that book. And, and so we studied in Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.23. Every human being stands condemned before a holy God because every human being 
are sinners by nature and practice, Jew and Gentile, male and female. God's holy nature and character stands opposed to the entire human race because they possess a sin nature and as a result commit sin. That's why Paul says in Romans 2, and while we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us. So God's holy, why, was, why were we, uh, 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 why were we enemies of God's? Because uh, uh, we're his enemies because we're sinners by nature and practice and he's holy, he's perfection. That means he can't tolerate sinners, sinners, unless a way can be provided for them so that he could have a fellowship with them and a relationship with him. And that way was through his son's death on the cross. So God's holy nature and character stands opposed to the entire human race because they possess a sin nature and as a result commit sin. You can uh, compare that with Romans 5, 6 to 8. Christ died when we were yet his enemies. Consequently, every member of the human race is under God's wrath. Which, and what does God's wrath refers to? It's his legitimate anger towards sin and sinners. Legitimate anger. That means God has every right to be angry with us sinners for the sins that we committed. He has that, that's, it actually, uh, it demonstrates, the fact that God get, exercises his wrath is a manifestation of his holy character. So I mean, when I say holy character, here's another way to think of it. He's pure, sinless. You and I are not. But through our identification with Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session, yes, we've been purified positionally, and in a perfective sense, in a resurrection body, our purification, our sanctification will be perfected then. But in the meantime, we can experience this purification from sin by having fellowship with God. So God's wrath or righteous indignation is an expression of God's holiness, as I pointed out before. However, from his attribute of love, God provided his son as the sacrifice which would resolve this problem the human race had in relation to God's holiness. God provided his son as a substitute for the human race in the sense that he, his son, would experience God's righteous indignation on the cross in place of every member of the human race because of his attribute of love. So Jesus Christ, as we've been pointing out, his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross as in our place, as our substitute, satisfied the demands of God's holiness which required that sinners experience his righteous indignation for committing sin against him. So uh, we see here that, that uh, you know, God did this because he loved us. And so when we think of God's uh, holiness, we think of his purity, from, and he, that he's totally separate from sin and sinners. And, but from his love, his love, which characterizes all of his actions... Think about that. All of his relationships with the believers and non-believers is characterized, characterized by this attribute of love. So to understand the meaning of the spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross, which propitiated the Father's holiness, we must understand, as I pointed out earlier this evening, what happened to the first datum. You can uh, compare this as documentation, Romans 5, 12 through 19. When the first Adam sinned, with his wife, they both received a sin nature. And in fact, the sin nature entered into the human race because of their sin. And consequently, they entered into spiritual death, which is the experience of being separated from God. So Jesus voluntarily did this, not because of sin, like Adam and Eve did. They sinned, and this is why they suffered spiritual death, separation from God. But Jesus did it as a sinless person, volunteered to do this. He voluntarily sacrificed his fellowship with his father for us, which was very valuable to him. Think about that, as we pointed out again. That's something so deep. This, that's, it is the depth of God's love, how much he loves us. So the sin nature resided in the genetic structure of our physical bodies, which is why the Lord said to Adam and Eve that their bodies would go back to the dust of the ground. And this is true of his progeny, uh, us, the human race. Therefore, the presence of the sin nature in the human body is the reason why members of the human race die physically. Members of the human race sin because they're dominated by the sin nature. Failure to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior will result in the sinner experiencing spiritual death in the lake of fire forever. And this is the second death and eternal condemnation. John calls it the second death. And Revelation 20, verse 14. The second death is simply this. The perpetuation of spiritual death in the lake of fire. We're not going to experience that because 
we have eternal life. Uh, we've been delivered from spiritual death uh, and physical death, not to mention physical death, because of our faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, Jesus Christ had to die spiritually in order to negate spiritual death in the human race. He's the last Adam who came to negate the effects of the first Adam's sin on the human race. He was experiencing spiritual death on the cross when the Father abandoned him and cried, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's telling us what he was experiencing us. And, uh, in fact, if you hold, uh, it, it, it's, I don't know if you have to, let me see, let me just take a look real quick. And he's quoting Psalm 22, by the way. Yeah, go to, hold your place, go to Psalm 22, verse 1. It doesn't say this in the Gospels, but the psalmist says, tells us what jo Jesus was thinking on the cross, or might even said on the cross, in addition to this. And telling us he understood totally why God had to abandon him. He answers the question in the psalm, not in the gospel. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I groan in prayer, but help seem far away. My God, I cry out during the day, but you do not answer. And during the night, my prayers do not let up. Now, David wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but Christ, he's, uh, the, 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 my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, is prophetic of what Jesus Christ would say on the cross. In fact, because we know this, because Jesus quoted from it. Then, here's the reason why, verse 3 tells us, the reason why God abandoned him. You are holy. You sit as king, receiving the praises of Israel. And you, our ancestors, trusted, they trusted you, and you rescued them. To you they cried out and they were saved. And you they trusted and they were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man. People insult me and despise me. This is just Jesus uh, used this of himself. All who see me taunt me. They mock me and shake their heads. It's prophetic of Jesus on the cross, the son of David. They say, commit yourself to the Lord. This is what they were saying to him on the cross. Let the Lord rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him, for he delights in him. Yes, you are the one who brought me out from the womb and made me feel secure on my mother's breast. I have been dependent on you since birth. From the time I came out of my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not remain far away from me, for trouble is near, and I have no one to help me. Many bulls surround me. Let's speak of the Romans, the crucifixion party. Powerful bulls of Bashan hem me in, and also the chief priests and the Pharisees. They open their mouths to devour me like a roaring lion that rips its prey. My strength drains away like water. All my bones are dislocated. That's from crucifixion. My heart is like wax. It melts away inside of me. This is Jesus telling us what he was experiencing on the cross. It's prophetic. The roof of my mouth is as dry as a piece of pottery. My tongue, because he, that's why he was thirsting on the cross. And the last thing he asked for was to, uh, for, for something to drink. And he says, they didn't even give him water. You set me in the dust of death. Yes, wild dogs surround me, a gang of evil men. Crucifixion party, the Jews, crowd around me. Like a lion, they pin my hands and feet. That's speaking of the crucifixion there. And this is before crucifixion was even invented. I can count all my bones. My enemies are gloating over me in triumph. They're dividing up my clothes among themselves. They're rolling dice for my garments. That's the Romans uh, gambling for the only clothing he had. And uh, remember, he was naked on the cross. And it was very expensive. That's why they gambled for it and not tear it up. But you, O oh Lord, do not remain far away. You are my source of strength. Hurry and help me. Deliver me from the sword. Save my life from the claws of the wild dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. Now, if go back to, uh, if you notice verse 1, my God, my God, why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then verse 3, he says, you are holy. That's the reason why the father had to abandon him. Because of the, his, holy, his demands of his holiness say, I must judge you in the place of sinners because if I didn't, I would, the sinners would have to face my wrath in the lake of fire forever and ever. And I love them. I want to have a fellowship and a relationship with them. They're my creatures. And so I'm going to judge you in their place and abandon you those last three hours on the cross so I could have a relationship and a fellowship with them for all of eternity. So go back, uh, you can go back now to 1 John 4.10. So Jesus Christ experienced spiritual death on the cross when the Father abandoned him and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. The Father was the member of the Trinity who was acted as the judge and the Son suffered the penalty and the Spirit 
according to Hebrews 9.14, as I pointed out earlier, empowered the Son to experience this judgment. After this, Jesus said, it is finished. And then he dismissed his spirit and died physically like no human being in history since he died of his own volition. Remember, he says in John 10.18, I can take my life, I, I can take away my, take my life and raise it and bring it back again. Because he's, he's God. He has that authority. His physical death, his Jesus Christ's physical death was important too. Because it was designed to negate physical death in the human race. And not only this, but to eventually eradicate permanently the sin nature from the human race. Because the sin nature resides in the human body. So remember, we put it out in Romans 5, 12 through 9, uh, 21. 12, 12, Romans 5, 12 through 21. God put the human race under two headships. The first Adam and the last Adam. The last Adam uh, was uh, negated what Adam did and gave us much more than what, than what Adam ever lost for us in the Garden of Eden with his disobedience. So, Jesus Christ's physical death negated physical death in the human race. And not only this, but it also would eventually eradicate the sin nature from the human race because the sin nature resides in the human body. Jesus Christ's resurrection was also designed to negate and eradicate the presence of the sin nature and the human race. Jesus didn't have a sin nature because he didn't have a human father. And since the spirit impregnated Mary, and thus the human body of Jesus was the result of the Holy Spirit impregnating Mary. That's Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, a body you have prepared for me. So our bodies that we have is the product of the sexual union of our parents. That's why the sin nature gets passed down. That's the seminal headship of uh, Adam, by the way. Uh, for those who are interested. So, we, Jesus didn't have a human father, so therefore the sin nature wasn't passed down to him. Okay? So that, that meant his human body did not have the presence of the sin nature. At all. So, the sin nature is, sin nature is passed down by the male through sex, but Mary did not get pregnant through a sinner, but rather through the spirit. Now, the moment... And we'll close with this. The moment a sinner trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, the Father imputes his Son's righteousness to them and declares them justified. That's Romans 3, 20-30, as well as Galatians 2, 16. And simultaneously, at justification, the Holy Spirit identifies the sinner who's trusted in Jesus as their Savior. They, he identifies them with Jesus in his crucifixion, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father, Paul teaches that in Romans 6, 1 through 6, Ephesians 2, 1 through 7, Colossians 2, 12, and Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Why identify us with those events in Jesus' life? Because these events were the means by which the Father resolved the problem of the sin nature in the human race, the problem of personal sins in the human race, the problems of spiritual and physical death in the human race, as well as eternal condemnation and condemnation from the law. It also, these events in Jesus' life, restored, and this identification with Christ in those events in his life, restored the image of God and mankind, and restored mankind to rulership over creation, and thus the need to identify the believer with Jesus Christ. So, when Adam fell, Satan usurped his authority in the garden. That's why he's called the God of this world. That's why he could offer up the... I know, I've heard some scholars say, when Jesus was making the temptation of Jesus in, the, in, in uh, the desert, I'll give you these kingdoms of the earth if you bow down and worship me. He could do that. Of course he could do that. They were his. That's why Paul says he's the God of this world. And so he's the ruler of this world, the prince of this world, Jesus calls him. So, if that, that, so he had that. He could do that. He could make that offer. Of course, Jesus turned him down, obviously. So... When Christ died on the cross and was raised from the dead and then was seated at the right hand of the Father, he now became the ruler of the earth. And remember, God said he created Adam and Eve to be rule over the works of his hands. Genesis chapter 2, right? Well, we don't see that. It says in Hebrews chapter 2. But we do see Jesus. And Jesus, the last Adam, has restored mankind, the human race, to the place in which God had, had designed it to be, ruling over the works of his creation. So we're identified with Jesus Christ, the creator and ruler over creation. And so that's pretty cool. We're in a place of rulership because we're seated at the right hand of the Father. And so remember that when you go in prayer. You're going to start looking at yourself, if you're not doing it already, with a little more self uh, spiritual self-esteem. The Spirit says you sit at the right hand of the Father. 
you're a rule, you're a, you're in the head, you're you're identified with Christ in his session at the right hand of the Father. You're the bride of Christ, and you're going to rule over creation in the millennial kingdom. So stop thinking about yourself according to your past life as a sinner, unregenerate sinner. Stop looking at yourself as God looks at you in union with his son, Jesus Christ, seated right at his right hand. So when I go in prayer, I'm aware of that. You'll hear me say in the prayer means that. I pray that everybody is sure of that and convinced of that, that that's the case, because it'll totally transform your prayer life. And uh, it, it'll, turn, it'll, it'll certainly will transform it. It'll be, more, it'll be a lot of fun. You'll see, you'll get gain a lot of joy knowing this and having this conviction. So this act of identifying the justified sinner, you and I, with Jesus Christ is called the baptism of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Colossians 2, 12 mentions it. The believer is now united with Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 teaches that. And now members of his body. Romans 12, 4 teaches that. Colossians 1, 18, to name a few passages. We're now under his headship. Colossians 1, 18. Whereas prior to our justification, our conversion, we were condemned before a holy God. Romans 3, 10 and 23. Where there's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And now, we used to be prior to our justification, we're under the headship of Adam, as we saw in Romans 5, 12 through 19. Now we're under the headship of Christ. So this identification restores the image of God in human beings and the believer's identification with Jesus Christ in his present session at the right hand of the Father restored the human race as ruler over the works of God's hands. Originally, as I pointed out, Adam and Eve were designed to rule over the works of his hands. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Hebrews 2, 5 through 8 as documentation. But Satan usurped this authority over the earth and rulership with the fall, which is why Paul calls Satan the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The Son of God had to become a human being in order to restore the human race to rulership over the earth. The Father placed his incarnate Son, Jesus Christ, as ruler over the earth as a result of his Son voluntarily suffering a substitutionary physical and spiritual death on the cross as a substitute for the entire human race. That's taught in Hebrews uh, 2, 9 through 11, as well as Philippians 2, 6 through 11. When Jesus ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father, he was given the title deed to the earth and rulership over it. The seven seal scroll is the title deed in Revelation 5, 1 through 5. At his second advent, Jesus will bodily assume rulership over the earth. Revelation 19, 11, the 20, chapter 20, verse 4 teaches that. And at that time, he will imprison Satan for a thousand years. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. And regenerate human beings, you and I, will assume rulership over the earth with Jesus Christ and rule with him for a thousand years. That could never take place unless the Father manifested his love by sending his son with authority into the human race to become a human being and suffer a substitutionary spiritual and physical death on our, in our place, which propitiated, satisfied his demands of his holiness that sin and sinners be judged. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a great blessing to your people and bring great joy and contentment and draw them closer to you in a more intimate fellowship with you, your son, and the Holy Spirit. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.